Welcome back to London, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with theCUBE, the leader in tech coverage, and we're here at AWS. We wanted to cover deeper the public sector activity. We've been covering this, uh, this segment for quite some time uh, with the Public Sector Summit in DC, went to Bahrain last year, and we wanted to extend that to London. And we're doing a special coverage here uh, with a number of public sector folks. Anjanesh Babu is here. He's a network manager at Oxford Glam. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thanks Oxford for having me. Glam, I love it. Gardens, libraries, and museums. You even get the A in there, which everybody <laughs> always leaves out. So tell us about Oxford <laughs> Glam. So um, we're part of the heritage and collection side of the university, and I'm here representing the gardens and museums within the division. So we've got world-renowned collections, which is been held like for 400 years or more. Mm. And it comprises of four different museums and the Oxford University Botanic Gardens in Harcourt Arboretum. So in total, uh, we're looking at like five different divisions spread across probably 16 different sites, physical sites. And the main focus of the division is to bring out collections to the world through digital outreach, engagement, and being f making uh, sort of being fun, bringing fun into the whole uh, system. Sustainability is big because we are basically custodians of our collections and it has to be here almost forever in a sense. And we can only display about 1% of our collections at any one point and we've got about 8.5 million objects. So as you can imagine, majority of that is in storage. Um, so one way to, br to bring this out to the wider world is to digitize them, curate them mm. and present them either online uh, or an an another form. So that's what we are good. And your role as the network manager is it's, it's, it's to make sure everything connects and works and stays up, or maybe describe that in a little more detail. So um, I'm the systems architect and network manager ah, okay, for the, for gardens and museums. So in my role, I my primary focus is to bridge the gap between technical and the non-technical functions mm. uh, within the department, and I also look after the network and infrastructure side. So there's two parts to the role. One is a BAU business as, as usual function where we keep the networks on going and we keep the lights on, basically. The second part is bringing together designs. Um, it's not just solving technical problems. So if I'm looking at a technical problem, I step out and almost zoom out to see what else are we looking at and which could be connected and solve the problem. For, for example, we could be looking at a web design solution in one part of the project, but it's not relevant just to that project. If you step out and say, oh, we could do this in another part of the program, and we may be operating in silos and we want to break down those. So that's part of my role as well. Okay, so you're technical, but you mm. also speak the language of the organization and uh, you know, business, I'd say. Well, we you know, put it in quotes because you're not a business per se. Mm. Um, so, okay, so you're digitizing all these artifacts uh, and then making them available sort of 24 seven, is that the idea? And wh what are the, some of the challenges there? So um, the first challenge is only 3% of objects actually digitized. So we've got 1%. Um, on display, 3% is actually digitized. It's a huge effort. It's not just scanning or taking photographs. You've got catalog accessions and a whole whole raft of databases that goes behind. Mm. And museums historically have, have got their own separate database collections, which is individually held on different collection systems. But as public, you don't care, we don't care. We just need to have a look at the object. You don't want to see, oh, that belongs to the Ashmolean Museum or the Petrobras. You just want to see and see what the, what the characteristics are. For that, we're bringing together a layer which sort of interrogates different museums. It sort of reflects what we're doing as in, in our SIT. The museums are culturally diverse institutions and we want to keep them that way because each has got as a history of a kind of personality to it. Under the, under the hood, the foundational architecture the systems remain the same, so we can make them modular, expandable, and address the same problems. So that's how we are, we are supporting this and making it more sustainable at the same time. So you got a huge volume. Mm -hmm. You got quality is an issue because people want to see beautiful images. Um, you got all this metadata yep. that you're collecting. You got a classification challenge. Mm -hmm. So how are you architecting this system, and what role does the cloud play in that? So um, in the first instance, we are looking at a lot of collections were, uh, were online in the uh, were on premise in the past, so we are moving as as a SaaS solution at the first step. A lot of it requires cleansing of data. Almost this is the state of s images. We are not migrating. We are sort of stop here. Let's cleanse it, create new data streams, and then bring it in the cloud. That's one option we are looking at, and that is the absolutely the most important one. But during all this process in the last three years, we have been with the Glam Digital program. There's been huge amount of changes. To have a static sort of golden image has been really crucial. 
And to do that, if we're going down the rate of on-premise and trying to build out scale out infrastructures, it would have been a huge cost. The first thing what, what I looked at is was explore the cloud options and Amazon presented solutions like Snowball and the storage gateway. Straightforward, who was up the data, it's in the cloud. And then I can fill around the infrastructure as much as want because we can all rest easy. The, st the, the, the main day one data is in the cloud and it's safe and we can start working on the rest of it. So it's almost like a transition mechanism where we start working on the data before it goes to the cloud anyway. And I'm also looking at a cloud clearinghouse because there's a lot of data exchanges that's going to come up in the future, vendor to vendor, vendor to us, and us to the public. So it sort of presents itself a kind of junction. Who's going to fit in the junction? I think the obvious answer is here. So Snowball uh, or Gateway, uh, you basically you either Snowball or Gateway the, the assets into the cloud mm -hmm. and you decide which one to use based on the, the size and the cost associated with doing that, is that right? Or? Yes, and convenience. Um, I was saying this the other day um, at another presentation and just, it's addictive because it's so simple and straightforward to use and you just look, go back and say like, it's taken me three days um, to just transfer 30 terabytes into a Snowball appliance and it's uh, on, the, on the fourth day, it appears in S3 buckets. So what am I missing? Nothing. Yeah. Let's do it again next week. So you got the snowball of life in 10 days, bring it in, transfer it. So it's much, it's much more straightforward than transferring it over the network and just you've got to keep an eye on things. Not that it's not, it's not. So for example, the first l workloads we transferred over s the file gateway, but there's a particular server which had problems getting things across the network because of a bit outdated o OS on this. So we got the snowball in. And within a matter of three days, the data was in the cloud. So to effect that every two weeks, I put in the snowball, bring it in two weeks, in, in three days, it goes up back in the cloud. So this huge system, and it's, it doesn't cost us any more to keep it there. So the matter of deletions are no longer there. So just keep it in the cloud, shifting, using our lifecycle policies, and just that it's, it's straightforward and simple. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Well, you understand physics and, and the fastest way to get from here to there is a truck <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, it literally, it is, it is one of the most uh, efficient ways I've seen and it continues to be so. Yeah, simple in concept and, and it works. It works. How, how much are you able to automate the end-to-end -end the, the process that you're describing? Um, at this point, we are, we've got a few proof of concepts of different things that we can automate, but largely because we are, a lot of data is held across bespoke systems. So mm -hmm. we've got 30 terabytes spread across 16 hard disks. That's one, another, uh, that's another use case um, at one of our uh, offices. We've got 23 terabytes that I'm just describing on, it's on a single server. We've got 20 terabytes on another Windows server. So it's kind of disparate, so it's quite difficult to find common ground to automate it. But as we move forward, automation is going to come in because we are looking at um, common interfaces like API gateways and how do you define that. And for that, we're doing a lot of work with, uh, well, not, uh, not essentially a lot of work. We've been inspired a lot by the GDS API designs and we're just calling this off and it works. So um, that is the roadmap we're looking at. But at the moment, we, we don't have much in the way of automation. Can you talk a little bit more about sustainability? You've mentioned that a couple of times, mm -hmm. and, and double click on that. What's the relevance? How are you achieving sustainability? Maybe you could give some examples. So in the past, sustainability means that you buy a system and you over-provision it. So you, you're looking at 20 terabytes for three years, let's go 50 terabytes. And something that's supposed to be here for three years gets sort of kept going for five, and when it breaks, the money comes in. So that was the, the kind of very brief way of sustaining things. That clearly wasn't sort of, wasn't enough. So in a way we are looking at sustainability from a new function saying, we don't need to look at long-term service contracts, we need to look at robust contracts and having place mechanisms to make sure the data is, whatever data that goes in, comes out as well. So that was the main driver. And plus, with the cloud, we're looking at a leased model. We've got an annual expenditure set aside mm -hmm. and that keeps, it's sustainable is a lot about internal financial planning and based on skill sets. With cloud, the skill sets are really straightforward to find and we've engaged with quite a few vendors who are partnering with us and they work with us to deliver work pack packages. So in a way, even though we're getting there with the skills in terms of training our team, we don't need to worry about complex deployments because you can just outsource that in sprints. 
So y you've shifted from a CapEx to an OpEx model, yes. is that right? That's and right. So, so what was that like? I mean, is, is that, was that life-changing? <laughs> was it uh, uh, exhilarating? <laughs> it was <laughs> exhilarating. <laughs> I think it, it was phenomenally uh, life-changing because it, it set up a new direction within the university mm -hmm. um, because we were the first division to go over the public cloud and set up a contract, again, thanks to the G Cloud 9 framework and a brilliant account management team from AWS. So we shifted from uh, the CapEx model, the OpEx model, with an understanding that all of this would be considered as a leased service. Because in the past, it's like you buy an asset, it depreciates. It's no longer the case. Right. This is a leased model. The data belongs to us, and it's straightforward. Yeah, and Amazon continues to innovate. You take advantage of those yeah. innovations. Prices come down. Take more. How about performance in the cloud? What are you see seeing there uh, relative to sort of your past experiences? I, I wouldn't say it's any different, perhaps slightly better, because we, uh, the university has got the benefit of a super fast bandwidth to the internet, so we've got 20 gigs as a whole, and mm. we use about two gigs at the moment. We had 10 gig. We had to downgrade it because we didn't use that much. So from a bandwidth perspective, that was the main thing. And performance perspective, workloads in the cloud, we frankly find no different. Perhaps, if anything, they're probably better. Interesting. And, and talk about security for, for a moment. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, early on in the cloud, people are concerned about security. It seems to have attenuated. But security in the cloud is different, is it not? And so talk about your security journey and what's your impression and share with our audience what you've learned. So uh, we've had similar challenges of security. On our, so from security, I would say there's two parts to it. One's the contractual security, one is the technical security. The contractual security, we were, we've, if we had spun up our own separate legal agreement with AWS or any other cloud vendor, it would have taken us ages. But again, we went to the digital marketplace, used the G Cloud 9 framework, and it was a no-brainer. Within a week, we had things turned around, and we were actually the first division to go with, go live with, the, with an account with AWS. That was to be really taken care of. As soon as uh, university has got a, a third-party security assessment template, which we require all our vendors to sign up. As soon as we went through that, it sort of s far exceeds what we what the university requires, and it's just a tick box exercise. Mm -hmm. And things like data in at, uh, data encryption at rest in transit it actually makes it more secure than what we're running on premise. So in a way, technically, it's far more secure than what we could have ever achieved that that's on premise, and it's all taken care of. It's Straightforward. So you have a small fraction of your artifacts today mm -hmm. that are digitized. What's the vision? Where do you want to take this? Um, we're looking at, uh, I'm speaking for on behalf of the gardens, but this is not per me per se, so I'm speaking on behalf of my team. Um, and basically we are looking at a huge amount of digitization and a, a large amount, the, the, the collection should be democratized. That's the whole aspect, bringing it out to the people and perhaps making them curators in some form. So we may not be the experts for a massive collection from say North, North America or the Middle East, there are people who are better than us. Mm. So we give them the freedom to make sure they can curate it in a secure, scalable manner. And that's where the cloud comes in. And we back end it using authentication that works with us, um, logs that works with us, and rollback mechanisms that works with us. So that's where we are looking at in the next few years. How would you do this without the cloud? Oh, if we're doing it without the cloud. Could you do it? Yes, but we would be wholly and solely dependent on the university network, the university infrastructure, and a single point. So when you're looking at, say, the bandwidth, it's shared by students using it, the network out of the university, and our, our collection visitors coming into the university, mm -hmm. and the whole thing that requires the DNS infrastructure, everything's inside the university. So it's not bad in, in its present state, but we need to look at a global audience. How do you scale it up? How do you balance it? And that's what we're looking at. And it would have been almost impossible to meet the goals that we have and the aspirations, and not to mention the cost. Mm. Okay, so you're going to be at the summit at the Excel Center yes. tomorrow, right? What are you looking forward to there for, as a, from a customer standpoint? I'm looking at service management, and uh, because a lot of our work, we've got a fantastic service desk and a fantastic team. So a lot of that is looking, we're looking at service management, how to deliver effectively and nimbly, because Amazon, as, you, as you rightly say, Amazon is huge on innovation, and things ch keep changing constantly, so we need to keep track of how do we deliver services, how do we, make ourselves more nimble and more agile to deliver the services and add value. So if you look at 
the OSI stack, that's my favorite example. So you look at the OSI stack, you've got seven layers going up from physical and all the way to the application. Yeah. You could almost treat an, an organization the similar way. So you've got a physical level where you've got cabling and all the way up to the people and presentation layer. So right now what we're doing is we are sort of making sure we are focusing on the top level, focusing on the strategies, creating strategies, delivering that, rather than looking after things that break, looking after the things that are operationally perhaps add value in another place. So that's that's where we would like to go. Great. And Janesh, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank it's you. A pleasure to have you. Thank All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there, we're back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE from London at Amazon HQ. I call it HQ, we're here. Right back. Stop.